Welcome, this is Mongo Slade. Today we're going to be talking about Bound for Glory. Apparently the final event under the Impact Wrestling banner. And they will be reverting back to TNA come January. So that's obviously going to be a big note we're going to discuss here in a second. We're also going to talk about uh, Bound for Glory. We're going to talk about the whole event. We're going to review the event because I did watch it. So let's start. Let's not bury the lead. At the very end of Bound for Glory, there was a skit in which a bunch of wrestlers got around in a circle at a campfire and basically said that wrestling was bleeding and it needed to be a revolution and we have to go back to where it started. And where it started is TNA Wrestling. So hard to kill. The next pay-per-view event will be a TNA branded event. This had led shockwaves throughout the internet with some people being very excited while other people being kind of confused and perplexed. But the response has been mostly positive with people actually loving the idea of it going back to TNA wrestling. I am, I sit on the fence of this thing because I ask more than one question. I don't think about things just from a fan's perspective. I also think about things from the perspective of business. I also think about things from the perspective of legacy. So I just, I consider things. So, Impact Wrestling has existed since, I think, 2015, 2016 or something to that effect. And they changed the name from TNA basically because people thought that the name was silly and they thought it meant tits and ass, when, uh, which was kind of the general idea about TNA when it first started because it had women in shark cages doing dances and stuff. And uh, the chief complaint was that the name change was necessary in order for people to take the brand seriously and for the brand to actually grow beyond its, uh, at that time, limits. So they wanted to be serious. They wanted to be mature, much like Buster Rhymes cutting off his dreadlocks or, or Ludacris deciding he's not going to do his bombastic style and cutting off his braids. Impact Wrestling thought they were going to rebrand by getting rid of the six-sided ring, which they kind of had already done. And changing the colors and embracing the name Impact Wrestling. Now, in 2023, they have decided, eh, we're going to go back. We're going to go back to being DNA. Now, here's, here's some, some honest uh, opinions first. One, you can never go back. You can never rekindle the flame of what TNA was when it first started. So, if, you, as long, if you're excited, you should temper your excitement right now. Because you can't go back. You can, it will never be TNA as it was again. It will, it's, it's, as long as it's going to be the same roster, working the same style, in the, as, as I watched here on Bound for Glory, as long as the same people are going to be in control, you're going to get the same product. It doesn't matter what you're going to call it. It's going to be the same product. Now, from a business perspective, the name TNA is probably more detrimental and again, it's one of those things where uh, offense is actually mar far more of a low bar today. Um, everybody in the wrestling sphere knew that TNA meant total nonstop action. It was other people who believed that TNA meant tits and ass. And those people who are still going to believe that they almost have no influence on the product anymore. And what I mean by that is when Impact Wrestling went to pop or Destination America or when it was on Spike and all that kind of stuff, there was a big um, there was a big push for things like sponsorships. You had to worry about getting a new TV deal and people wanted to know what the name of the show was and how they were going to market and promote the show. Now you don't have to worry about that. Anthem owns the company uh, Impact and they own the network Access TV. Who are you trying to impress? You know, well, you still could use some sponsors in order to help your product grow. But ultimately, uh, if Anthem doesn't need the money or they don't prioritize sponsorships or uh, public perception and you're not going to get booted to another network, then there really is nothing to be lost in turning yourself back to TNA. And you just give new fans or old fans the opportunity to come back. But uh, the th there's a thing about evolution never going backwards. And that's always been my issue 
And when I heard about this initially, I heard about it, it was the one thing that was on Bound for Glory that was spoiled before me. I actually watched it. And the I, I didn't it didn't elicit any excitement into me. I just said, well, evolution doesn't go backwards. So what you're trying to do here is basically playing a nostalgia role. And we'll see if it works. I think it's not going to work for long because, again, the same people are in control. The same talent are going to be in place. And this, if people weren't watching it under impact, why the hell would they watch it? Just because you called it TNA. Um, what people liked about TNA is, uh, you know, the Samoa Joes, the AJ Styles, the Christopher Daniels, the way that they presented the X Division, you know, Kurt Angle and Christian and, J and Jeff Jarrett and all this kind of stuff. And some of the, the storylines and some of in how unique it looked. And so I say this, if they decided to go back to the six sided ring, I would be very interested because it would, it's what made the brand different. It would, it's what made the brand stand out. If they go back to the six sided ring, then I think they have a better chance of success. And they also have a better chance of collecting new fans who maybe, maybe they have seen, you know, clips of impact before, but they've never had an American or North American wrestling promotion. Well, I shouldn't say that because Mexico is on North America. But they don't have an English-speaking, holy oh, shit, a primarily English-speaking North American promotion with a six-sided ring. You know, an impact would be very unique in that regard. Uh, but it, you're going to have to overhaul pretty much everything in order to get any real interest out of this impact reboot. I mean, you're going to have to basically get rid of everybody who's in the front office. You're going to have to reboot a lot of the talent. You're going to have to refocus the booking. You're going to have to do a lot of different things that I don't think they're interested in doing. I think they're just going to rebrand the company and it's going to be the same under the hood. And at that point, uh, you're not really doing yourself much good. So while everybody's very excited, I'm glad you're excited, but I'm just being, you know, a realist and realistically, I don't see what the big, what the big deal is. A lot of people never stop calling it TNA in the first place. So, <laughs> I mean, it is what it is. And the evolution of your company cannot be backwards. This is not evolution. This is nostalgia. Nostalgia works sometimes. We'll see if it works for Impact to basically rebrand and try to merge Impact Wrestling as a concept and TNA as a concept and see what comes out of it. But until it actually happens, which apparently is going to happen in January, um, I'm just making my preliminary guess is that everybody who's super excited right now, they're going to watch a couple of episodes, realize it's the same product that they weren't watching already, and then they're just going to go back to not watching it. And um, it's very unfortunate, <laughs> but unless they actually implement some rapid changes uh, or as, as some serious changes, I don't see this helping very much, um, if we're being honest. Okay, so one of the things that they actually are changing is that there is apparently going to be a talent swap. Quite a few people are leaving Impact. Sammy Callahan apparently is already a free agent. And has been flirting with both WWE and AEW. I hope he goes to AEW to be with his friend Moxley. I do not want him in WWE at all. I dislike Sammy Callahan very much. But also PCO, who apparently is leaving in later October. Even though he won the Monsters Ball on this show. Spoilers. Um, and then there's also some conversation about Will Ospreay. Whose contract is expiring, I believe, in February 2024 from New Japan. And he lied to Impact and basically told them that they are in the running for companies that he's interested in signing to long term. And the reason I say that he's lying is because why would he pass up the gobs of money that Tony Khan is going to give him in order to go work in the rebranded TNA? I mean, why on earth would he do that? Even if he's going to end up being the centerpiece of the promotion, um, I still don't see that being worth it, you know? Um, unless he can still do shots, which, you know, who knows, but, uh, this is the very, to me, the Will Ospreay thing is the very definition of leading a girl on, you know, you, you don't really like her, but you'll let her buy you stuff and you'll let her take you places. And you're not really feeling her though. You know, girls, girls do it to guys more often, anyway. <laughs> but you get my, you get, you catch my drift. Um, another is Sunny Kiss made 
his, her, him, they uh, <laughs> debut in the Call Your Shot gauntlet is 100% on brand for Impact to, in uh, TNA to bring in Sunny Kiss. I mean, this is the company that has Giselle Shaw on it already. And it already has like a stable of those kinds of individuals on it uh, right now. So their uh, PCO isn't a major loss. The guy's like 68 or something like that. He's taking crazy bumps. We'll talk about that later. But um, he's an older guy. You know, Sammy Callahan has been around for a long time. Not exactly an older guy, but he's an also ran on his in his company. Um, him being gone, is not going to really hurt the brand in any way. PCO leaving is not going to hurt the brand in any way. Sonny Kiss being there likely is not going to hurt the brand in any way because the people who are going to watch it are going to watch it regardless of Sonny Kiss being there or not. Um, but again, this company is very on brand. In terms of a lot of the stuff they were doing and the kind of people who run this thing, yeah. And we'll talk about the kind of people who run this thing a little bit later. All right, let's talk about Bound for Glory. All right, so they had a white ring with the white ropes. And I thought that was actually pretty neat. It actually made it feel like a special occasion. They are in Chicago. It seems to be sold out in that building, but it doesn't seem like it's a lot of people. I doubt it's more than a thousand. Hell, it might have been 600, 700 at the most. First match, Kenta versus Chris Saban. Uh, Chris Saban wins the match with the Cradle Shock. This match was based off of Kenta being on a three-month winning streak, I guess in general, because he hasn't been in impact for three months. But he hadn't lost a singles match in a long time until now. Uh, this was an obvious decision that you're not going to put the belt on Kenta. And this match itself wasn't really anything special. It was kind of a standard wrestling match. It was not just not exciting. It was a standard opening match. It was fine. The next match was a Monsters Ball match. It was a hardcore match. Moose, Rhino, Steve Macklin, and PCO. Each man was let out of a dark room where apparently they had been locked away for 24 hours with no food, light, or water. Which would basically mean they all are weak as shit and tired and sleepy. <laughs> if you got locked away for 24 hours with no water and no food, you're not going to come out like a raging maniac. You're going to come out dehydrated and you're going to need help. Uh, but whatever. I guess they give them Gatorade on their way to the ring. Um, the only thing in, about this match is that PCO powerbombed P, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Moose powerbombed PCO on concrete blocks covered in thumbtacks. That was just nutty you know what a what a nutty bump that was um and <laughs> it didn't matter any because pco ended up winning the match by pinning moose uh bully ray came off came into the ring at one point and pushed steve macklin off the top rope through a table covered in barbed wire um because steve macklin had called him soft in a previous segment on the show um very interesting stuff it was kind of standard i don't really care for anybody in this match so it was hard for me to get behind it. So we're two matches in, and I was kind of like, oh, brother, I don't know what to do. Then the third match, uh, the second match, or the third match, I'm sorry, ABC Austin Bay Club versus the Rascals for the Tag Team Championships, and this match was really good fun. Um, Trey Miguel and Zachary Wentz, uh, Austin and Bay, four smaller guys, fast-paced match, um, a lot of spots um, they had told the story from the beginning of the rascals being guys who, who cheat a lot and they had cheat to, in order to get this, uh, the titles in the first place by using the good hands. And now they have kind of fallen out with the good hands and now they're on their own. Um, part of, uh, the story was also that they spray painted the belts, which uh, ABC saw as being, you know, you're desecrating our championships that you cheated to win. And so in the match, uh, Zachary Wentz went to spray the face of one of the uh, Austin Bay guys, and he ducked and he ended up spraying Trey Miguel in the face. Then uh, Trey gets bumped outside the ring. Zachary Wentz gets killed with like double finishers from Bay and Austin, and he ends up getting pinned. So the ABC are the new tag team champions. The first really good match of the night, and my favorite match of the night. This this ruled. This was very good. Next match. Speedball Mike Bailey versus Will Ospreay in what was called the one of the matches of the year. I look at it and say it's basically a Will Ospreay match. 
two generic guys with reputations for being good in-ring wrestlers, but no personality between the two of them, uh, doing very weak strikes and very highly cooperative and rehearsed moves to each other, um, which is, again, every Will Ospreay match. But the crowd being so alive for it was actually very good. Um, there was at one point where Speedball Mike Bailey was about to do his very... Um, elaborate spin kick from corner to corner where he does like these tumbles until the spin kicks um and will osprey absolutely smashed him with like the back lariat what they call the uh what do they call it the uh hidden blade but he hit him from the front instead of hitting him from the b- pause instead of hitting him in the back of the head he hit him in like the chest area that should have been the finish because that looked like a football block that was great um but they kept going because they always keep going um, and Speedball Mike Bailey does a fisherman buster from the top rope. That's a fisherman suplex. That's the perfect plex from the top rope. And only got a two count. I was like, bro, end this match, please. Uh, <laughs> they did a bunch of other stuff to him, each other, before Will Ospreay hit the hidden blade, which is the elbow to the back of the head, followed by the Stormbreaker, which is his, um, I think it's like a, I don't know, some kind of cutter. Anyway. Uh, Will Ospreay won the match. The crowd was very excited. They loved this. Because of the fan energy, it's hard to not like it. But it wasn't my thing. It wasn't my style. It wasn't the kind of match that I personally care for. But it's the match that these guys love a lot. So it, it was fine. If you like the Will Ospreay style matches that are very fast paced with a lot of cooperation and a lot of other horse shit, then it'll be just for you. But for me, it was a good match between two guys who neither one of whom I care that much about. And it won't really change the trajectory of their careers or it won't sell any tickets in the future or nothing like that. I mean, maybe Will Ospreay sold some tickets to this show, but I don't see how this is going to help, you know, Mike Bailey's career. I don't know. There's two bland, generic dudes. All right. Match four, the Call Your Shot Gauntlet, a 20 person battle royal because it featured men and women. The winner of whom can challenge for any championship that they want at any time. Uh, it feels like they just did this with Impact 1000 in the, call, in the uh, Feast or Fire briefcases. So um, basically they did the money in the bank uh, four weeks before the Royal Rumble. <laughs> Which makes no sense. LOL TNA already. Um, there, was two, there was three surprises in this match. One was Sonny Kiss. Now um, again, Sonny Kiss... Completely on brand for TNA to bring that kind of guy in here. Uh, but the first surprise was the Juice. Juventud Guerrera. Excellent. I love the Juice. I know he's not the kind of guy you bring around long term. But I'm going to pop every time I see the Juice. Uh, the Juice is great. The Juice is loose. Always. The second was Matt. Well, the third was Matt Cardona. Um, always fun for him to pop up to. Uh, him choosing to not stay in TNA probably has been for the best for his career. I think if he'd have been an impact, he probably would have been the world champion, but I don't think um, he would be as in demand around the world as he would have been if he'd have stayed in TNA. Um, he was there basically to hang out with uh, Brian Myers, and they did some stuff together in this match, but whatever. Um, now, the Dirty Dango was the last guy, and he's hanging around with this guy named Oleg Prutius, who is Vladimir Kozlov. Now, they brought him back, I'm guessing as part of this angle between Dirty Dango and Santino Morella, because Santino and Vladimir Kozlov are former tag team partners in a past life, which was WWE like 10 years ago. Look, the guy looks great, you know, with the beard and the shades and everything. He just looks like a Russian mob boss. And that's better than what he was doing in WWE. <laughs> so as long as he doesn't like get in the ring and wrestle, things ought to be fine. I like him as a heavy, as a uh, Mr. Hughes type type of character. That would, that could be very good. It didn't help him much because uh, Dirty Dango was eliminated almost immediately after getting in the ring. Um, uh, the the rules of the Call Your Shot Gauntlet is that it's a battle royal up to a point, and then it becomes a singles match when you get down to the last two people. So once they got down to the last two people, the last two people were Jordan Grace. And Bully Ray. And you, you, if you'd have thought about it for even half a second, 
you know Jordan Grace won this match, but how did she win? Well, she used her finish, which, you know, she picks people up. So she picked up Bully Ray in what they call the Juggernaut Driver. It used to be called the Grace Driver, but they changed the name of it to her new gimmick name. And I just say, okay, so not only is a woman probably about to challenge for the world title, but she beats a 300 pound man to do it. And, um, this is why people do not take this company seriously. You know, like it's, it's crazy enough that Jonathan Gresham was in this match and him and Jordan Grace were actually trying to eliminate each other. So this was literal domestic violence. Like people talk about, Oh, the, the intergender wrestling. It only makes people think of domestic violence. They literally had Jonathan Gresham try to throw his wife out of this match. Now they didn't, you know, chop and beat each other to death in here. But um, the fact that he had to wrestle his own wife and ultimately lose to his own wife. I mean, how much how much more carny shit can you possibly do now? Again, the kind of people who are running this company, basically Scott Demore. I mean, it's he's running this place into the ground. I have such a problem with Tony Khan, Triple H and Scott Demore. For starters, Scott Demore is dating the talent. You know, oh, wait, wait a minute. What do you mean? Yeah, because, you know, Vince, he got fired and all that kind of stuff because he got caught fucking the talent. But Scott Demore fucks the talent. It's perfectly fine. It's OK because he puts up pictures on Instagram. And for the record, the person he's fucking is Giselle Shaw. So that should tell you why Sonny Kiss is there. Now, I'm not going to get into any details about what I think Scott Demore's sexual proclivities are. But it says a lot when... uh <laughs> he he's dating the talent now at the very least i can give him credit because giselle shaw isn't like a, a top wrestler in the company or anything like that giselle shaw is at the very least a mid carter or a low carter but the fact is he has his i hate the i hate the use of this word but it's actually the most um appropriate word his partner as a wrestler on the roster he's the boss he's the wrestler. <laughs> Vince got kicked out of his company, a multi-billion dollar company, because he's, he was suspected to have been banging the talent. Um, this guy is banging the talent. Everybody knows it. And at least it, everybody's like, well, at least Giselle Shaw isn't getting the push. I'm like, wait a minute here. This bum. All right. He's Canadian. I don't know. I guess it's like uh, certain societies where you're allowed to date your cousins. <laughs> I don't care. I promise I don't care. I'm just saying. Uh, all right. Match five. Well, the call your shot down was horse shit because Jordan Grace won. So it was, it's was automatically horse shit. All right. So match five. Knockouts title Trinity versus Mickey James. Uh, Mickey uh, Trinity wins the match with the star struck submission hold. It was okay. Uh, solid, but I, I don't think it actually met, met the great category. Just kind of from solid to good. I think that's where it landed. Um, there was a spot in which Trinity rubbed her booty in Mickey James face to which Mickey James responded by giving her a V check, which is, you know, the taking your two fingers and licking it between them. And, uh, that got a pop, but that was probably the biggest pop of the whole match. <laughs> we being honest, but, uh, it was okay match. It wasn't, it wasn't terrible. Um, and Trinity wins, which was probably the right decision. Um, so that was fine. And the main event, Alex Shelley versus Josh Alexander for the impact world title. Uh, a straightforward, nothing special match in which Alex Shelley just plain won. No twists, no turns, no surprises. It never, I think, hit the second gear or let, let alone a third gear. So I think that the show being bookended by the Murder City Machine Guns and matches that were good but not great, um, having one really good match in the middle, that being the tag team title match, and I guess Will Ospreay and uh, uh, Speedball Mike Bailey was enough. You know, the show was okay. You know, it wasn't awful. I didn't feel like I wasted all of my time. I did feel like I wasted some of it, but not all of it. And um, the TNA Hall of Fame. Let's talk about that before we wrap things up. Uh, Don West, who has uh, passed away, Tracy Brooks, and Mike Tanay were all inducted into the TNA Hall of Fame. Uh, and this was a classy affair, you know, it's always, you know, good to have a hall of fame and have people be recognized. Um, so this was nice. 
Um, nothing too, nothing absurd comes out of that either. So TNA continues to, well, impact TNA, whatever you're calling it. It continues to just be a wrestling promotion. It kind of feels a lot like an indie promotion too. And um, that's the thing that I really have been kind of eh about when it comes to impact. You bring in ringers like Kenta and Will Ospreay. Instead of building up people, you know, you just bring in guys who some guys are brought in just to do a job. Some guys are brought in just to have a great match. And then that's it. You know, your regular roster guys offer nothing in terms of storytelling or if they do, it's minimal. And that just makes for an incredibly dry product. And this product is super dry, you know, right now. And uh, if they're going to talk about we're going to go back to being TNA, well, you got to spice things up because TNA didn't at least it didn't have a dry product. But, you know, this impact thing has been dry for like four years now. Enough's enough. It's time to spice some things up. You know, you got Jeff Jarrett on AEW being covered in ketchup and mustard. You need that guy probably. <laughs> you know, you should probably try to get that guy to come back. I know everybody's like, oh, bring back Vince Russo and Jim Cornette. Like, come on. Uh, you need the founder, you know, you need the founder, get, bring the founder back. That's the, that's the, that's the least you could do. I think if you're going to bring back TNA, at least bring back the founder, bring back Jeff Jarrett, because at least he knew what the fuck the product was and what the product needed. And even though it doesn't need him to be at the top anymore, at the very least, it needs up some spice. So but let me know what you guys thought if you watched Bound for Glory. Uh, like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out, y'all. Thanks. Playing Sega Genesis with bros. Now I'm gaming with some folks on the other side of the globe. Used to go through a label if you trying to blow. Now people got.